This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 188, recorded on October 25th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. How's your weather? You got a hurricane? No, it's you're good. It's- it's from the West Coast blowing across, and they're pred- predicting rain all weekend. We haven't seen a drop. So my guess is it's going to rain all weekend. Hey, what's your temps down there, roughly? Is it pretty warm still? No, it cooled off, mercifully. Mm-hmm. It it cooled off, and right now, I'll check the weather app like they do on TWIV. <laughs> right now, it is 68 degrees, which is, of course, 20 degrees Celsius, I think. If I'm doing my conversions right in my head and um, tomorrow's going to be 78 for a tie and Saturday's going to be 70 with clouds and Sunday we get back the sun with 72. So mm. it's finally cooled off. Last week we had 90 and I went out to San Fran- the San Francisco, Sacramento area and gave two talks at two different VAs and California weather is just spectacularly gorgeous and fortunately i came home to gorgeous weather here in in charleston speaking of vas and hospital i have to tell you this a a columbia student came by we were chatting the other day and there's a company here in new york i think it is i think it was formed by former former columbia people but i might be wrong it's called kinos k-i-n-n-o-s and what they have developed is a product for hospital instead of refitting with copper, they have these wipes that have a blue color that gets transferred to whatever you're wiping and it goes away in five minutes. And so that's long enough to disinfect. And so that you don't have to tell people, wait five minutes before you wipe off the stuff because the color simply goes away. Isn't that wow. cool? <laughs> that is very cool. What What's the active ingredient? I don't know. I'm going to look into the company. Maybe we can get them on Twim. Talk yeah. about it, you know. <laughs> yeah, let's 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 bring them on because I tell you, I was out at it was infection control week at these two particular VAs in in California, and they had a number of different vendors who were there, and some of the vendors were promoting new products. But highlight is is a product I, I hadn't heard about, nor have I have I seen from from Kinos. But one of the cool things they had was a wearable device that actually had the equivalent of gas chromatograph in this badge that you wore. And if you zapped your hands with um, alcohol Mm -hmm. and you wiped your hands and then you literally scanned your hand across this badge, the badge went to a green light. So the patient would know that you have washed your hand Mm -hmm. with an alcohol Mm -hmm. sanitizer. If they were in an isolation room where you're supposed to use soap and water, it would have a different detector that would smell the soap and the water, and it would change to a pleasant blue color. So the patient would always know if the clinician was following the hand hygiene guidelines, and it mm-hmm. was a much mm-hmm. more efficient. And so this product that you just talked about um, actually uh, reinforces that behavior because um, – by the time the color disappears, yeah. it's yeah. it's ready to go. Very cool. But the thing is, you still have to wipe the surfaces quite frequently, right? Yes, yes. The bacteria literally come out of the woodwork, so to speak, uh, within um, typically four to six hours, depending upon <laughs> how well the biofilm has established itself in there. And that's, you know, been in the news, especially in, in New Jersey now with this deadly outbreak of adenovirus. Last night I saw on the news that eight children had passed from mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. outbreak and it's principally due to failure of hand hygiene. And the news was very much concerned about adenovirus uh, killing children. But the one thing that they failed to articulate in their story is that the hospital that this was occurring at 
was one that treated immune compromised children. Exactly. Exactly. So the adenovirus <laughs> is not any more aggressive than probably the adenovirus running around your school, your child's school or your child's daycare center. It just so happens that the kids that were in this long-term care facility happen to be immune compromised. So I don't think we're going to see a widespread epidemic of lethal adenovirus. And so I would be interested to hear your thoughts. That's exactly right. It's a long-term care facility. The kids are immunocompromised. These viruses circulate all the time everywhere. And most people wouldn't know the difference between a, a cold and caused by rhino or adenovirus. So in this facility, though, these kids have problems clearing the infection, so they get more serious infections. And as you say, they have bad hand hygiene, but also in a closed facility, the kids are more likely to pass it to each other. So what happened was someone walked in with it. They were probably sick, but had either no symptoms or very mild. They exhaled it or they got uh, mucus somewhere, and that started the chain of infection. But yeah, probably the re- on their toys, yeah. probably on their toys. Yeah. So the rest of us are not at any risk, uh, but this is, these are some of the subtleties that, yeah, they get lost. Although one article I did see mentioned in the body of the article, this immunosuppressed, but I'm not sure that people would understand that, you know, these are kids who are, I'm, I'm not sure the cause of the immunosuppression it could be genetic, of course, and, um, Cancer therapy. Cancer therapy, right. And some certain kinds of therapies will immunosuppress you. Of course, other virus infections will immunosuppress you, like measles and HIV-1. But uh, it destroys your ability to respond to other infections. And you can have inborn errors that immunosuppress you. I was just looking at a paper the other day where they studied a child that had recurrent serious rhinovirus infections. They sequenced the genome and had a mutation in... Uh, in the interferon pathway Hmm. that confers the inability to deal with infections. So, you know, with genome sequencing, we're learning more and more the basis for some people getting serious respiratory infections. And with the cost of sequencing coming down, I think it's one of the most important things we can fund in every public health department to know and understand what viruses and bacteria are running loose and to actually begin to sequence those and to to have, if you will, a database of the usual suspects akin to what the FBI does. Yeah, totally. You know? totally. Everybody has to have their genome sequenced at birth. It goes into your medical record. And then researchers can mine it. You know, it's, yeah. it's going to be a gold mine of information on what's going on in our genome. You know, you can look at all these interferon pathway genes. Go, wow, look at all these new mutations we hadn't seen before. Because we don't, what have we sequenced? Less than 10,000 human genomes, right? Yeah. It's nothing. It's nothing in the big scheme of things. Well, it's- if you have, have your genome done by 23andMe and you buy the more expensive version, the medical variant, to see in addition to figuring out which country your ancestors came from, you figure out what you may, what illnesses may be in your genome. You can actually download your own uh, DNA because they, your own DNA sequence because they sequence it. So I, this past summer when Amazon was having its Amazon Prime sale, I um, did my genome and figured out what I already knew from my relatives. And I, I figured out I wasn't adopted because my parents were true in telling me where my grandparents came from. Mm. And I then downloaded my uh, genome and it's sitting on my computer. Mm. Yeah, but I don't know if, if 23 does a sequence. I think they do just um, you know, microarrays. No, I got, I got the whole kit and caboodle. They do exomes? Yeah. Really? I got the whole kit and caboodle. Mm. I got to go back and look and see if there's exomes, but it was a big, big file. That's interesting. Yeah, I, our son, one of our sons had his exome sequenced uh, here at Columbia for medical reasons. And okay. that, <laughs> I think the bill for that was 25 grand. Holy moly. Of which I, I, I paid 500 bucks because. Uh, the deductible. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the insurance company paid for it, but that's ridiculous to pay yes. that much money for something that is far less expensive, right? I'd yeah. like to get a hold of it, though, to take a look at it, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, it's we were talking about this the other day, that it's a gold mine of information, depending on what you're looking for. You can look at mobile elements in the genome, how it differs among populations, or all sorts of mutations and so forth. So I'm hoping um, 
one day that happens. Yeah. Now we have uh, one letter before, as 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 listeners may have gathered, there's no one else here but Michael and me. It's just us. Uh, Michelle is fulfilling her presidential responsibilities for ASM, attending the board of directors meeting, and Elios fulfilling his uh, community responsibilities and attending, uh, what was it, something about fungi. Mushroom something, mushroom yes. club or something? It's always, like? it's always about mushrooms with yeah. Elio. Yeah, so it's Michael and I, so we're going to just talk for hours, right, Michael? No, to, to, to basically fill it <laughs> We're going to get in trouble. So first we have, before we get to some uh, science, we have a follow-up from James who writes, this is with respect to the last episode, I think, quote that Michael was trying to say and Vincent got correct was, many Bothans died to bring us this information. I believe that was in Return of the Jedi. It was a quote from Mon Mothma. The quote Michael was thinking of was, these are not the droids you are looking for. Of course, that was Obi-Wan when he and Luke and C-3PO and R2-D2 were Entering Maz Eisley Spaceport. LOL. Yeah, I have watched all the Star Wars movies way too many times. <laughs> Thanks for the great podcasts. I'm a regular listener to all the Twix plus immune podcasts you do. Long time, past biology and chemistry, double major, and 25 years in the pharma industry, having sold many antibiotics and antivirals, really makes me love and appreciate all the info you guys share. Also love the Ronald Jenkins music you use on all the shows. Have downloaded several of his tracks. James is from Austin, Texas. James, we did Twiv 500 in Austin this summer. Should have come. Maybe he was there. Speaking of antivirals, just this week, the FDA approved a brand new one for influenza. Did you know that, Michael? I, I saw that. That made our actual paper this morning. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, I guess, similar. It to Tamiflu, except you only need to take one pill. It's, from totally, Anderson. it's totally different. It's a different mechanism of action. Oh, that was not in our paper. Yeah. So it's so called, how does it work? It's called Zofluza, Exofluza, and it is an inhibitor of the viral endonuclease. Ooh, that's new. So it's the first new flu drug in 20 years, brand new mechanism of action. So the endonuclease is part of the RNA polymerase of the virus, and it's needed to cut the caps off of cellular mRNAs so they can be used as primers for the viral polymerase. So this binds to the endonuclease, this drug inhibit it, inhibits it, and it blocks virus production. And so it went through phase one, phase two, and phase three, shown to be effective in uh, patients with uncomplicated influenza, a little bit better than uh, Tamiflu, which they compared it to with. Uh, but again, you need to take it within 48 hours of onset of symptoms. Otherwise, it's otherwise there's too many viruses wandering around yeah. the neighborhood. And that's it. And it makes perfect sense. But it's good because if you have uh, resistance to some other flu drug, you could try this. But what I think would be the most interesting would be if they tried a combination, a dual drug therapy with mm -hmm. this drug and, say, Tamiflu. Of course, they have to do a clinical trial to test that. But two drug therapy. It solved the problem of resistance for hep C, so it could for the flu as well. And that would be very, very big. Yeah, for sure. So that's good. That's cool news. And James, you probably know about that since you're in, in pharma. All right. Let us, we do have some more letters. We'll read them later, but let's move on. And Michael has a snippet for us. <laughs> I'll start with the first snippet. This is entitled A Synthetic Dual Drug. Cideromycin induces gram-negative bacteria to commit suicide with a gram-positive antibiotic. And this appeared in the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, and it comes to us from a laboratory of Lou, Miller, Vakulenko, Stewart, Bogus, and Miller, all in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. And there are a couple of facts that we need to know before we start this stem. First, iron is an essential micronutrient. It's required in micromolar concentrations by bacteria in order to sustain infections. It's needed for DNA replications involved in the iron sulfur centers in the membrane to move electrons. So it's, it's an essential element that all cells need. Yet the concentration of free iron 
in infected tissues is very low because we, of course, have the remarkable thing called transferrin. And in a typical aerobic neutral pH environments, its concentration of iron is at 10 to the minus 18 molar or about 10 to the minus 12 micromolar. So you see bacteria are continuously starved for iron. So that's fact one you got to remember. Fact two is gram-positive bacteria are very different than gram-negative bacteria. Gram-negatives, of course, have this second membrane or outer membrane that can effectively exclude antibiotics limiting their effectiveness. Or should they get across that outer membrane and present themselves to the cell, the cell then has efflux mechanisms where even if the antibiotic gets in, it gets pumped out before it can actually reach its target. The other thing is gram negatives have a much thinner cell wall. The peptidoglycan is only a bimolecular layer of peptidoglycan, so they don't have as many crosslinks facilitating the holding together of that molecular corset that contains the bacterial cytoplasm. Gram positives alternatively have a very thick peptidoglycan layer with many crosslinks associated with it. And recall that bacteria are under tremendous pressure, just like graduate students, <laughs> and they're at about 80 pounds per square inch. So any antibiotic that interferes with crosslinking can make the organism lice simply because as they grow, that pressure results in the fracturing if the cross-linking hasn't take place. And that's what the beta-lactam class of antibiotics do is they prevent cross-linking. So as the cell grows, those cross-links that are not present, it effectively allows the cell to explode. And we've all seen the pen pop movie on YouTube and so complete with the sound effects. So here's the story. They hypothesize that all bacteria are in a desperate need for iron. And through clever biochemical synthesis, they constructed a turducken. <laughs> this is a turducken of an antibiotic. And they also called it formally a sideromycin. If you have not heard of a turducken, you probably will if you watch Food Network, because this is the time of year turduckens become possible. But this, this concept really helps you visualize the wonder of this sideromycin. So a turducken is a turkey with which a duck has been stuffed inside the turkey in which a chicken had already been stuffed into the duck. So the turkey portion of our turducken is the where the, a siderophore is. And a siderophore, of course, is a public good whose job it is, is to harvest iron from the medium or steal it from our cells simply by grabbing it away from things like uh, transparent. And then that siderophore is actively transported, and this is important for gram negatives, it's actively transported across that membrane that normally would exclude antibiotics from entering and getting access to the cell and being internalized in the cell. The second piece of their turducken or the duct portion is a cephalosporin and it may be active against the cell wall of a bacterium. However, should the microbe possess a potent beta-lactamase, and here's another fact that you probably already know, but you should have in the back of your mind as we think about this, is the beta-lactamase is a soluble protein that bacteria export to destroy the family of beta-lactam antibiotics. Some bacteria produce more, some bacteria produce less. If you have the beta-lactamase on a plasmid, it will produce much more because you make more message, you make more protein off of the plasmid than you do off of the chromosome. The third piece of their traducan or the chicken piece is a antibiotic that traditionally only is targeted against gram-positive organisms. And it's a family of antibiotics. And the one that they use in this particular case is oxazolidone which is a class of anti-ribosomal 
antibiotics that are very effective against gram positives, but really have no effect against gram negatives, secondary to them being effluxed away before they can knock down protein synthesis because of their interference with the ribosome. So the first part of their very detailed manuscripts goes into the elegant synthesis of how to construct a turducken, or in this case, they refer to it as a dual Trojan horse and with the, the siderophore being the uh, Trojan horse of, about it and the two invading armies inside the horse are a cephalosporin and an oxazolidone. The concept of coupling siderophores to an antibiotic is not new. And in fact, Mother Nature figured this out long ago. There are even natural variants out there in Mother Nature. Synthetic variants have also been uh, developed. So this is not a new concept, but it's one that I think bears talking about because the danger of gram negatives is that we're not having very much luck developing new classes of antibiotics that can inactivate the gram negative. So if we can figure out how to trick them into bringing in an antibiotic for which they were naturally resistant, why not go ahead and try? And this siderophore complex can also uh, been shown to actually uh, inhibit antibiotic in inactivation. And in fact, one of the interesting things they volunteer in their introduction is that this strategy of coupling a siderophore to an antibiotic enables the delivery of an antibiotic regardless of its size or charge. Mm -hmm. Recall that if you've ever looked at structures of antibiotics, they often are very much positively charged, and so it's hard to get in across that negative membrane. And they provide examples in their manuscripts. And one that was most curious to me is they talk about an anti-malarial drug that really has no activity against bacteria. And in their example, they talk about this anti-malarial drug being active against mycobacterium tuberculosis. Well, we know that mycobacteria tuberculosis has its own very special iron siderophore called mycobactin. And so when the, it's in the literature, when they couple mycobactin to this anti-malarial drug, then anti-malarial drug now works on TB and only TB. Do these, because some, uh, do these poor, these transporters, these siderophore transporters, do they have size limit of what they can bring in? It doesn't appear, well, the, the antibiotics are relatively small, but yeah. it appears that they're, they're getting in. Yeah, I think it's more of charge mm. and it's, it's through the active transport system. Because these molecules they make are all Organic molecules, they're not proteins or anything. They're just no, no, no. They're all organic. Yeah. They're all very complicated. It looks like a schizophrenic organic chemist actually synthesized these. Well, what and Nixon would call it is dihydroxy chicken wire. Dihydroxy chicken wire. That's exactly it. <laughs> I was trying to remember his expression, but now that, that you mentioned, isn't that great? Dihydroxy chicken wire, and it, it fits with my metaphor of a turducken. Yep, turducken is awesome. That's just the, great. Well, it, it's actually what it's doing. Now, secondly, the elegance of their system is that it anticipates or requires resistance to be held by the organism they're attacking. And so what happens is as that beta lactamase made by the bacterium to confer resistance against the cephalosporin acts, it actually releases then the oxalitidone, except now the oxalitidone is close enough to get into the cell. This is cool. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's truly the Trojan horse yeah. metaphor, yeah. but you know, it, they built this really cool thing and the, the chemistry is just elegant. They produce spectra showing us how to do it, but I was interested in the microbiology. So again, their foundational hypothesis was that the siderophore would transmit this siderophore and siderocin antibiotic across the outer membrane, and with the beta lactamase cleaving the cephalosporin, this would then expose the oxalidone to the cell, where it would transit into the cell, affecting its ribosome target. Now they tested 
this construct or turducken against a strain of Acinetobomani. Acinetobacter bomani has a very potent chromosomal beta lactamase. Mm. And as expected in their experiment, they, they do all of the appropriate controls. They have a non-conjugated oxalidodone for which it had no effect on the acinetobacter. They have cephalosporin by itself and they mix and match and all of their mixing and matching of the appropriate controls had no effect whatsoever. They then conjugated the siderophore to the oxalidodone alone. And the problem with that is the siderophore oxalidodone, the siderophore got across the outer membrane, but when it got inside the cell, it really didn't have the activity that they anticipated. And they hypothesized that it was either unable to reach the target of the ribosome or it was somehow sterically excluded from affecting its antimicrobial effect and protein synthesis um, considered. But the combination or the intact turducken worked beautifully. You dropped the MIC from 50 micrograms, or excuse me, 50 micromolar, I believe is how they present it as, all the way down to 0.8 or excuse me, 0.4 micromolar of the compound tested. So it's it's really showing you how well this hybrid molecule actually delivers the drug to the right target. They next tested their traducan against four clinical isolates of Acinetobacter pomani, and all four were resistant to, again, the control compounds tested which was the oxalidodone, the cephalosporin, the siderophore plus the oxalidodone, and then the intact complex. And the intact complex was very uh, sensitive, acutely sensitive to the tribred molecule. But then they did a riff on the experiment. They had an acinetobacter that had a plasmid that had a very, very potent beta-lactamase on the plasmid. So obviously it's going to increase the concentration of beta-lactam cleavage. And when they looked at that number, the MIC 1.4 micromolar up to six micromolar, which makes sense because in the past you had two antibiotics that could do the dirty deed. And now you only really had one, however much of the um, hybrid molecule was was getting cleaved. So it's absolutely fascinating how this compound behaved when they were testing these these compounds. Michael, also, can I ask you a question? Please. So when um, you get through the outer membrane, then you're in the periplasm, right? Right. And there's the beta-lactamase, is that right? The beta-lactamase is there. It cleaves, and cleaves it off. And now how does the, the oxa get Across the inner Through membrane. normal normal membrane transport. I see. It just comes in via active transport because got it. it's got over the barrier of the outer membrane. Okay. Now, I notice also the Siderophore plus Ceph is also not bad. No, that's good too because what happens there is the Siderophore brings it in and puts it in the protective environment where right. they're, because they're constantly exporting beta-lactamase. And so- right. They do really don't go into the concentration of the beta lactam, beta lactamase enzyme in the periplasm versus the outside, mm-hmm. and you know it's it's just an elegant experiment. And so the cleavage of the ceph off of the siderophore doesn't inactivate the ceph, right? It just allows it no. to be separated. And that can go in, and and then finally these numbers, 0.8 micromolar, is that a therapeutically useful concentration? Oh, now we're going down the rabbit hole of MIC. The answer is no, Okay. <laughs> because MICs are, they're sort of related to the therapeutic level, but these MICs are in the therapeutic range. They would be considered therapeutic. Would you have to tweak this to get it better or is this, you think they would try treating patients with these things? I think they would try treating patients with this. Mm-hmm. The only danger I would say is you're effectively given a pathogen iron. 
Yeah. And often that is one of the principal virulence factors. So it's not going to be without risk because if your organism that you're testing has happens to be resistant to the oxalidodone, mm-hmm. in addition to be resistant to cephalosporin, you've now given the pathogen iron, which will make it all that much better. Yeah. Well, since you don't treat these infections with these antimicrobials, you probably don't have as much resistance, right? Inherent resistance. Yeah. That is indeed correct. But the, these Balmani strains are terribly resistant, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. The, this is the scourge. The, um, this is what, when I was working on my DOD project, this is what the kernels referred to as Arachobacter. It's, it's one of these mm. agents because it's a common soil organism and when IEDs would go off, they would get driven into the wound of the mm-hmm. poor mm-hmm. trooper, and it would effectively result in, in uh, very bad infections. And uh, they really had nothing to treat them because if it was plasmid-borne, it would just trash the uh, cephalosporins. And the antibiotic industry has gone to great lengths to develop antibiotics that can get into gram negatives, can target gram positives. And the oxalidodone is the, that class of antibiotics has principally been used to go after Staph aureus, uh, MRSA, mm-hmm. and um, enterococci, uh, strep pneumo. It's, it's really against gram positives. So I think the take home for all of this is that this traducan concept facilitates the entry of an antibiotic to an appropriate space and thus avails formally an untapped class of antibiotics Mm. for use in gram-negative microbes. And as they went through the synthesis, it seemed like a relatively straightforward synthetic process to make their traducan. It Mm -hmm. didn't seem any more complicated, though I'm sure we'll get letters from chemists about how complicated the chemistry is, but if you've ever made a turducken, it's it's complicated too. Mm-hmm. So th- this was, um, you know, really pretty pretty neat. And the fact that they were banking on the cephalosporins uh, needing to be cleaved, and one of the experiments that they showed is that if you fail to cleave that linkage molecule. Uh, you just didn't have as as much activity, right? And that was one of their control molecules, where the oxazolidone was coupled to the siderophore. So I, I think um, you know, based on the background that they presented and the evidence for for this, there may be hope that we can get these antibiotics into the clinic sooner because oxalidodones are already approved, cephalosporins are already approved, and it's just the coupling of the siderophore to this whole mixture that may make pharma say, we can take the risk on this and and do a trial, and it will be the inferiority trials that, Mm -hmm. you know, is it better or worse than what we are currently using? Hmm. So on TWIV this summer, we were at Texas A&M, and they they have a phage therapy group there. And they told us the story of a gentleman in the San Diego area who had come back from the Middle East with a, a Balmani infection, untreatable, was in a coma, was going to die. And his wife looked up phage therapy, found Texas A&M. And to make a long story short, they came up, I think they got a phage from the Navy. That was specific. From, from Merrill. They got it from my good friend Merrill. Yeah. And, he, and they gave it to him. IV for two weeks, and he's fine now. He's walking around. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I, I tell you, when when I was working on on phage therapy, we we could literally cure a mouse of a full blown systemic infection of Pseudomonas aeruginosa that was growing like gangbusters, and we just inject the Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, IP under the mm. mouse's skin, and the phage homed to the location um, in contrast to the phage that was given to the person in San Diego. Ours didn't exponentially expand like true phage therapy does. Ours was targeted with one of these toxin-mediated genes. And so we actually put in a, a defined dose, hit it, and it works. So phage therapy is possible, but again, 
the organisms are often lysogenic to the phage, which is why you need a cocktail to hope mm. that it doesn't have the repressor proteins in. So if you have never read Mark Potashny's book, The Genetic Switch, it will give you a sort of a overview of the limitations that phage therapy may encounter because of the whole issue of lysogeny and what triggers lysogeny mm. and all of the repressor proteins. But yeah. it can work, and it has worked. Well, that group there has uh, Rai Young, right? He's of course. Head, and he is very circumspect. He said, we're not ready yet. He says, I get calls every day to to cure someone, but we're not ready. And, uh, you know, people understandably want to have it if someone they know is sick, but it's pretty amazing. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. That's very cool. Turducken. I think we'll call this episode Turducken Antibiotics. Or or it could be pigs get fat and hogs get butchered. What, because what does that mean? I don't get that. That's a South Carolinian expression. Pigs continue to eat, and that's the case of the gram negatives eating the siderophore to get themselves the precious iron. But if they eat too much, they're going to bring in more of the antibiotic, and so they're going to be a hog. And then they'll end up getting butchered by the antibiotic. But I like your Tuducan one, too. Yeah, those are both good. Yes. All right. I'll have to I'll think about that. Okay, I have a paper for you. It is published in the Journal of the American Chemical Society. And, you know, the paper we just did was in another kind of journal. Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, yeah, two, also an ACS journal. Yeah, two ACS journals. How about that? This one's called Bacterial Genome Containing Chimeric DNA RNA Sequences. And we have as uh, first author, Angad Mehta, Wang Reed, Supakova, Java Hishvili, Chaput, and Schultz. We come, they're coming from the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, the Bay Area Innovation Center, which is in Hayward, California, and University of California, Irvine. This is a curious paper. I'm not sh quite sure what to make of it, but I thought we'd just toss it out there. It's under the heading. Yeah, I don't quite know what to make of this, but this was in our <laughs> this was our week for supporting ACS journals. That's right. We wanted to support <laughs> them. We don't read their papers very often here on Twim. This is all about the idea that at one time the world was an RNA world. Organisms had RNA genomes and they slowly became DNA for a variety of reasons, and DNA is more stable. And DNA genomes got much bigger than RNA genomes, as far as we know. And and this paper says, well, I should say the authors say, well, they probably didn't go immediately from RNA to DNA. There was some kind of a continuum phase. And so can we find uh, an organism with a hybrid DNA-RNA genome? So they're using E. coli, and they want to engineer it so that you get some RNA in the DNA. And this is not this is not something that hasn't happened before, that you can find ribonucleotides in the genomes of both bacteria and eukaryotes. And of course, there are viruses with RNA genomes as well. So that's the idea. They want to say, could we make a hybrid bacterial genome? So they start with E. coli, and they use what they call metabolic engineering to try and reduce the, the overall strategy is to reduce the amount of deoxy CTP in the cytoplasm. So of course, DCTP is one of the four building blocks of DNA, right? We have C, G, A, and T, and eventually this would be phosphorylated because you need a triphosphate to incorporate into DNA as it, it's being replicated. But they said, if we lower uh, cytoplasmic DCTP, can we, encourage the incorporation of, of RNA into the genome. It's or the R version. The R version. The ribo sugar version. Instead of the deoxy ribo, it's, it's the ribo version. Yeah, so the the ribo version has two hydroxyls, right? And the yes. deoxy has just one. You need at least one at the three prime position of the sugar so that you can attach the next base. But uh, RNA has two of them. So the way they do that, if you want to know how they do it, so here's a little detail. They introduce a number of genes into E. coli to do this. The first is a, and these are T4 bacteriophage genes, 
One is G f- gene 56. In the old days, the phage people used to just number their genes. <laughs> There's a lot of famous ones like gene 32. I remember in graduate school, I was a, a DNA binding protein, I think. Mm-hmm. All right, gene 56 is a phosphatase that removes the phosphate from CTP and CDP and U and D. So that removes it from the precursor pool. And you need the phosphate on in order for it to be incorporated. Gene 42 is a DCMP hydroxymethylase. It will cut methyl off of DCMP. Gene 1 is a deoxyribonucleoside monophosphate kinase that will phosphorylate deoxy-TMP, deoxy-GMP, 5-hydroxymethyl-CMP, but not DCMP and not DAMP. And finally, gene CD is deoxycytidylate deaminase. Now, the the result of all this is that you're going to decrease the DCTP pool. And the, the paper, I don't know if it's open access or not. I can't remember. But there's a lovely figure in the beginning which shows you what happens with all of these uh, enzymes present in E. coli. And you will basically be lowering the DCTP pool. And when they grow E. coli with these extra genes, or they've introduced in, a pla- in two plasmids, when you grow E. coli, you can see that about 60% of the genome has 5-hydroxymethyl-C substituted for, two prim- for DC, basically, All right, which is what their strategy was meant to do. They're reducing the DC and they're introducing genes that will hydroxymethylate or produce a hydroxymethylated form. And in fact, you get 60% of the genome substituted with that. And they, they know this because they, they do a lot of um, mass spectrometry to figure out composition Pool size. of the DNA. Yeah. Now, that's just step one, because that's not RNA. That's just a modified C base. But the principle is there. You could... Get a different base in if you reduce the DCTP concentration. Then what they do is they mutagenize uh, these E. coli that contain their plasmids that have these phage genes on on them that I just mentioned. They use nitrosoguanidine, which Michael will remember because I don't know if anyone uses this anymore. Obviously, it's a cancer causing agent. Those have all been drummed out of everyone's lab. But we, people used to use it to introduce mutations randomly into the genome, right? Absolutely. And they do that and they get weird colonies. They call them morphologically distinct colonies, right? And And they show you them. They show you the colonies and they say the cells, if you look under the microscope, are spherical. And as everyone should know, E. coli is not spherical. It's a rod-shaped right cell. So now they have mutagenized this E. coli containing these plasmids and you get weird colonies and spherical cells. And they sequenced the 16S uh, ribosomal DNA. It's E. coli. It's not a contaminant. You're pretty careful to do that because that's, I think, the first thing you'd think. Oh, we've got oh, a yeah. contaminant in here. And um, when they analyze the genome of this weird isolate, they see ribonucleotides. And they can pick a colony and grow it up again. and the ribonucleotides increase with these two plasmids that are, remember, reducing DCTP concentrations in the genome. I mean, it's just basically draining the pool of water. So if you have no water in the pool, you're not going to be able to swim. And by virtue of the fact that you're increasing the ribo variant of this, what all cells must do is make DNA in order to divide and recall that that is what triggers cell cycle division is the, another copy of the genome. That's the only way it's, it's going to actually happen. So it's a forcing function. The cell is forced to use the pool of the ribo variant of C. But remember they mutagenize and that gives them, RNA. The, the original yes. variant still has a deoxy C. It's a variant of hydroxymethyl. But when they mutagenize, then they get RNA incorporated into the genome. So there's some something has been changed. They don't know what it is that is causing uh, incorporation of RNA. And that only happened after uh, nitrosoguanidine immunogenesis. My 
speculation is they change the specificity of the substrate of the enzyme that's calling for DCTP to be less picky about what it incorporates into the yeah, growing I mean, nucleic acid. Could be the polymerase, right? Could be the polymerase, could yeah. be you know, any number of things that is bringing the C to the table. So they purify DNA from this strain. Um, they say the yield is really low. That could be because it's breaking up, right? There's uh, mm -hmm. the treatment, the treatment uh, conditions to purify DNA might be breaking it up. In fact, there's an RNAs treatment during isolation. So, yeah, <laughs> that would probably do that it. Would just, that would ruin your day. <laughs> that would. And then they digest the DNA into single nucleosides, and they do mass spec. Uh, and you, then they can actually quantify the levels of ribonucleosides. Um, you get about um, the C, which is a mixture of RC and DC, is about 4%. Uh, the RG plus DG is 53%. The RA, these are ratios, I'm sorry. The RC over the RC plus DC is 4%. The RG over the RG plus DG is 53%. So 53% RG. And 57% RA. So they're getting incorporation of RNA uh, into this DNA. Uh, and they, they did a bunch of experiments to rule out that there is RNA contamination. They spiked in uh, ribonucleosides and ribonucleotides into the genomic lysates. And they show that they're still getting um, this RNA into uh, their DNA. So is this trait heritable? They grow the cultures on plates. They pick individual colonies, they isolate DNA, and they show there's uh, RNA in the DNA as well. And these, these strains grow significantly slower compared to the parental strain. So something is wrong with them. So the question is, is this RNA on one strand only? So you could imagine a DNA-RNA hybrid, right? Or mm -hmm. is it a chimera where you have DNA linked to RNA on the same strand? And they, they isolate uh, the DNA, and they digest it to oligonucleotides, dinucleotides and trinucleotides, right? You don't want to digest it to mononucleotides because then you wouldn't know what the neighbor is. Right. So di and tri, and they analyze that by, by mass spec, and they can see the D linked to the R nucleotides. Wild type is only D, say DC, DG, 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 et cetera. But the uh, the mutant strain, you get RG, DG, and DC, RG, et cetera. So you get chimeric dinucleotides. In the same strand. The same strand. So this is a chimeric genome. It's not a, you know, a hybrid DNA strand, RNA strand, but it's a chimeric DNA bound, uh, covalently linked to RNA. So this has to then change the topology of the helix. And as you think about um, why it's impacting growth, as the because RNA DNA hybrids are much more stable, so they're they will melt much more slowly. Mm -hmm. So transcription uh, off of the chimeric molecule will likely take longer because of the melting function in order to read the coding strand to make your uh, tran your transcript yeah. that will then get converted into protein. And that fact that it's still growing slow also helped to convince me that they were truly getting a chimeric strand where you had the the deoxy and the ribo in the same strand. Right. So their hypothesis is that they've lowered the CMP pools by their addition of these genes. And that causes, and that together with some mutation in the DNA machinery of some kind gives you RNA nucleotides in the genome. And so they look at the pools of free deoxy and ribonucleosides. They lysi collate, they do uh, mass spec on that. And they can see a drop in the DC, DA, and DG but not, D, not T in this mutant strain. Um, and so this is consistent with what they think is, is going on. Uh, the next experiment is um, whether other polymerases will incorporate RNAs into DNAs. And they take the venerable Klenow fragment of E. coli DNA polymerase 1. Now, Klenow fragment lacks the exo, right? 
It does indeed. The exonucleus. We used to use this for cloning years ago because it wouldn't chew up what it made. I was going to ask you, when was the last time you heard the enzyme clenow? And when was the last time you saw P32 yeah, in these, a paper? Yeah, these these things people don't use anymore. Exactly. I used to use this as a postdoc. You probably did, right? Oh yes, by the gallons. And uh, we don't use P32 anymore. It's people have figured out safer assays without it. And but, they uh, and they used it at 250 microcuries of raw phosphate. Yeah. So these were glow in the dark bacteria. Yeah, they do a template, and they they add this polymerase, and they add either DNTPs or RNTPs. And in fact, Clenow polymerase will incorporate ribonucleotides if you don't give them the DNTPs. <laughs> so that's very interesting. This is a wild-type enzyme. Yep. Right? It'll incorporate RNTPs if you just take away. Now, this is a short little synthesis they do. They use two oligonucleotides with a gap and they show that it fills it in, but say, can it make longer DNA? So here's another one, Michael. When's the last time you heard M13? Oh God, <laughs> 30 years. So M13 is a single stranded DNA phage that we used to use for sequencing. We used to clone, Absolutely. it had a double stranded DNA replicative form. You could clone inserts into it. We used to do shotgun cloning. We shotgun massive collections of restriction fragments into the replicative form, we put it into, we transform it into E. coli, get phages out, pick plaques, and you sequence each single stranded phage because it's single stranded. You could just anneal an oligo to it. We used to crank out so much sequence. Of course, this is all for the museum now, as someone told me. All for the museum. <laughs> yep. I used to do mutagenesis with M13. Yes. I'd put absolutely. in the, the mutant variant, but. You know, M13 is a very smart phage. It would actually go to the chromosome, get the right copy mm. that behaved better, and get rid of my mutant variant. Yeah, we used, to, we used to use it for that, too. The beauty of it is you could pick a plaque, and you just lice it, and you have single-stranded DNA, and you could hybridize an oligo for mutagenesis oh, yeah. or sequencing. But here they ask, if we now put a primer on M13, can we make a big product? What What is the length of M13? It's at least eight, seven, six. Yeah, KB. it's it's it's, it's, plas it's your garden variety high copy plasmid. And they say you can make full length M thirteen, um, which has RNA in it. It's sensitive to RNase H. RNase H is an enzyme that will cleave an RNA part of an RNA DNA hybrid. And this happens again if you leave out a DNTP and put RNTP in instead. It will this enzyme will incorporate it into the M thirteen. A template. So I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if this is covalent or strand specific. They didn't do the same kinds of experiments, but the polymerase is definitely incorporating RNTPs uh, into it. And that's interesting because that's the clenow. It's a wild type. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the next thing they want to do is say, what's with this strain of E. coli that we mutagenized and that. Um, is able to incorporate RNTPs into DNA. Well, they have um, they have some problem isolating and sequencing the DNA, so they they can't actually sequence the DNA uh, of this. So they have to do proteomic analysis. I know I'm jumping ahead here, but I'll go yeah. back. I'll go back to the other. They look at the proteome, all the proteins, because they can't sequence the DNA. So it doesn't work in their, in their Illumina sequencing, probably because there's, there's RNA in it, I guess. It, it's RNA. Remember, Illumina works by chain termination. Yeah, it's not going to work on this. But you know what they should have done is digest the way they, the DNA and take the RNA and sequence that by RNA-seq. They could have converted it to DNA. Or they could have done Maxim Gilbert sequencing, which is truly yes. a museum. It's truly, it's what I use to sequence polio. Yeah, and right. that would have worked. Yeah. So they have, have they have no genome sequence. So instead they look at the proteins and they do two-dimensional protein uh, gel electrophoresis. And they say, wow, this strain is really weird. And they say it's got one or one to three mutations per peptide that they get here. And they say this is unprecedented amount of mutagenesis. And so maybe this is, this strain has a lot of mutations in it because it's uh it's transcribing an RNA DNA template. Maybe that's not good. Well, it's probably getting slop in the base pairs. Probably. 
and it um, and it it depends on how it lines up and whether or not the polymerase that's either reading the DNA or the ribosome that's reading the transcript may be stuttering. Right, right. So they are able to make similar strains by a variety of um, manipulations you know, independent of this one. And I won't go into that, but in the end, they get RNA incorporated uh, into DNA. They use another technique called pulsed field gel electrophoresis. Now, this was a technique where you can run on a gel very, very large chromosome size fragments of DNA, which you can't usually do on a normal uh, kind of gel electrophoresis. So they can uh, identify big pieces of E. coli DNA and show that they have uh, RNA in them. They're, they're, sig- they're sensitive to uh, RNAs. So, which will change their mobility in the gel that's right. because you add the RNAs to it, it de- degrades it, and then it changes the size of the fragment. Yep. Exactly. And finally, they look at some uh, RNAs H mutants of E. coli. Got a lot of noise outside my window here. Uh, but you're high up, aren't you? Yeah, you know, we have um, an Air Force base up the Hudson River, and often the, the fighter jets fly by. Oh. They're pretty noisy, you know. I, I do indeed. They don't, I, they, I have them <laughs> fly over my house often. They don't make an effort to make them quiet. They don't have to, no. I guess. All right, so RNase H is an enzyme that will cleave the RNA portion of an RNA DNA hybrid. And E. coli has RNase H. And uh, so they make some RNase H mutants. They delete, there's two alleles for RNase H in the genome, uh, and they delete them independently. The, um, they see an increase in the, in the amount of ribonucleotides in the genomes. And uh, they say, well, you know, when you get DNA synthesis, they're primed with Okasaki primers, and part of that is an RNA. And so maybe you're not excising those RNAs, and that's what's causing um, the uh, the presence of ribonucleotides in those genomes. Now, when they take their original strain, which has these mo- metabolic engineering plasmids in it, and they put that together with an RNA-SH deletion, uh, these strains are really messed up. And they say this probably crosses the amount of RNA that the genome can tolerate. So that's the story. We have a strain of E. coli where a good fraction of the genome, 60%, is RNA. It seems to be linked to DNA. And some of the questions I have are, where is this RNA in the genome? Now, it could be just random throughout the genome. or it, Michael, in, in the E. coli genome, is there a lot of space in between genes? No. Not a lot, huh? No, it's it's pretty tight because, remember, prokaryotes have effectively truncated their genome size for efficiency in replication. They want to be as small and tight as, as possible. Uh, it's a rare event that you have much spacing mm. between it. And, again... We have to consider the selection pressure is going to be where you can actually either have a tight hybrid where the juggernauting uh, RNA polymerase will effectively open up, they have sufficient energy and mass to plow through that much stronger hybrid uh, that is taking place in its replication. Mm. It's it's probably not going to be near the insertion site or the uh, operator region of of genes because the RNA polymerase effectively has to dissolve the DNA uh, complex mm. in order to get in, and so that's going to be minus you know what fifty to two hundred bases upstream depending upon whether or not there are any um, activators. And also, it's going to be unlikely around the repressor that effectively is binding double-stranded DNA. And I wonder if repressors, how repressors interact with RNA. It would be interesting to take one of these hybrids out, engineer it so that it looks like pick your favorite uh, promoter, 
and hook it up to um, a beta gal gene or a GFP gene and ask what it does to repressor release mm. and and yeah. read through. And that will probably give you an idea of why these things are growing slower or what, why the mutation rate is as high as it is. It was a, a fascinating story as to how or the driving force of why pick one form of nucleic acid over the other yeah. and why the chimera is really a, a no-go. Well, in the end, they say this shows that you can get chimeric RNA DNA in E. coli. So maybe it tells us that in the old days, you know, from the RNA to the DNA world, there were such intermediates, right? Yeah. I think they need to study exactly where this RNA is. I think that would be quite interesting. Yeah. And like you said, is it is it avoiding uh, control regions of genes or what? You know, it should be interesting to look is at. Is it around the origin of replication? I would bet not. Yeah, probably not. So those strains dropped out. And we lost them because you know, yes. they weren't infectious or or they weren't able to grow, yeah. And yeah. what we have left, and they say, you know, the, the population is uh, is much smaller, and these are the ones that are able to survive. So I, I guess we'll be hearing more about this. I think it's okay. It seems good to me. It doesn't seem like arsenic, right? No. <laughs> it doesn't seem like arsenic. They did the right controls with the quenal fragment. Yeah. I don't think it's in – if if the arsenic story had the quenal fragment with – the appropriate arsenate-based nucleotides, then I would have been much more comfortable with the arsenate story. Right. I mean, we wanted the the centrifuge that showed that it was arsenic versus uh, phosphate. Yeah. All right, there you have it. Let's do a couple of emails. Uh, we have one from Mike who writes, this is in response to a letter read from Jonathan on TWIM 183 regarding viable but non culturable cells in chlorinated effluent of municipal wastewater treatment plants. During my undergraduate studies, I interned with a very supportive lab manager at a, such a facility. The lab also used IDEX, I-D-E-X-X, and we were curious if the chlorination levels were inducing a V, B, N, C state, viable but not culturable. With resuscitation methods using amino acid supplemented media, and extended incubation times, we obtained isolates that were confirmed as E. coli and would have otherwise been uncounted. As Michael mentioned, any oxidative damage would push some cells into the VBNC state. So what we saw was not very surprising. What is interesting to think about, though, is that as operators, we try to be as cost-effective as possible. We chlorinate just enough to keep bacterial counts low to meet permit requirements but anything more than that would generally be considered wasteful and expensive. I also wonder if UV disinfecting systems would induce similar VBNC states and if the cells would resuscitate or regain virulence after entering the receiving waters and sunlight. Well, sunlight would give them more UV depending on how high they were in the water column. Mm. And it is a good question. And ultraviolet light does indeed induce VBNC states if you don't completely kill them all. Yeah, as you said, depends on how close to the surface, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all about the photons that hit the nucleic acid, yeah, and how much water it in the water molecules inside the cell have to generate the free radicals that will then transition it into the VBNC state. Yeah, yeah this is a second or third uh, email about this. It's a very interesting issue. Uh, Jonathan, Mike continues, I'm a new listener, first-time writer. After the internship, I obtained my MS while surveying bacterial insertion sequences. I now manage and operate a small laboratory at a wastewater treatment facility, but I'm gearing up to submit applications and return for more school. Thanks so much for your podcast. They're wonderful to listen to in the lab and keep me pleasantly distracted on the treadmill. I especially enjoyed the discussion of Antarctic soil bacteria surviving on atmospheric gases in episode 169 and reading the paper afterwards. I write from Seattle where it is currently bluebird skies and in the 50s. Hoping you all the best, Mike. That was really nice. Thank you. I guess uh, additional uh, education is PhD, right? Yes. Good luck with that, Mike. 
Michael, can you take the next one? Rajesh writes, hi, Dr. Vincent. Love your podcast. Thank you so much for such amazing, rich, and extensive discussions of every couple of weeks. I'm an avid listener and have listened to you all at multiple times. Thanks in advance for the book on antibiotics as well. (laughs) I don't know if he won the book or not. Um, I don't think so. I think these are leftovers, yeah. (laughs) And then Kara writes, greeting Twimmers. Long-time listener, first-time writer here. I stumbled upon your podcast when I was taking general microbiology and wanted something to listen to between studying. I frequently knit when I listen to your podcast. I had the pleasure of taking general micro not just once but twice, first as part of my undergraduate degree in biology and second, more recently, as a prereq for nursing schools as schools require classes be taken within 10 years of applying. Not to my surprise, little had changed in the world of general microbiology. Gram stains are still gram stains and flagella still wiggle. That is why I'm thankful for your podcast as it delivers thorough and entertaining insight into some of the latest research in the field. As it turns out, I am starting a direct entry nurse practitioner program this fall and the antibiotics text would be a welcome addition to my growing library. Thank you for all that you do and keep up the good work. Sincerely, Kara. P.S. It was 84 degrees Fahrenheit, clear and sunny today in Boston. I think it's snowing in Boston today. Anything including locusts is better than snow. <laughs> locusts. Yes, locusts. Well, we'll have more books to give away in the next yes. couple of weeks. Kim writes, greetings, TWIM crew. I have been aware of the existence of TWIM since 2016, shortly after graduating from high school, wanting to enlighten myself about the noble field of microbiology. It was not until early this year, though, that I started to listen more actively to TWIM and the other Twix podcasts. While listening to these podcasts, I have also become aware of how important science communication is in helping people understand how important science is and how it works. Additionally, after listening more frequently, I feel like I feel like the passion you put into these topics have passed on to me so much so that I have considered careers in virology, mycology, and molecular biology, although I won't have to choose in a long time. I'm currently starting my undergraduate studies in biology on the 3rd of September. Would appreciate a free book on antibiotics as it might be useful. Thank you for all the time and work you put into these podcasts. I feel podcasts like these are necessary for showing people that science isn't scary unnatural or something only scientists can understand or do, but wonderful, logical, and something anyone can understand or do. It's a partly cloudy Monday morning here in Yavaskila, Finland, with 15C, 77% humidity, and 3 meters per second wind speed. P.S. Don't worry if you butcher the name of the city. It's hard to pronounce if you are not Finnish. Well, I tried. Let me know how I did, Kim. Too many umlauts. I should take the next one. All right. Rebecca writes, hello, TWIM team. I've been a longtime listener. You've helped me through some rough times, as silly as that sounds. Even before getting into the sciences academically and while agoraphobic, I was able to learn through the podcast, struggle through papers, constantly grabbing a dictionary, making notes on the important facts and concepts. You won't read this email, but I felt like saying thank you so much for everything. You're doing a lot of good in this world. Sincerely, Rebecca. Well, we did read it, Rebecca. Thank you. It's very nice. Yes. Justin, go ahead, Michael. That's your topic. Yeah. All right. Justin <laughs> writes, regarding TWIM 183, antibiotic sensitivity in less than 30 minutes, wouldn't using a personal cell phone and with PHI violate HIPAA, even if it was just to use as a camera for a microfluidics device? I know it made me really uncomfortable when I was with my mom in hospital on Long Island, but I won't name names. And the doctor was showing her pictures of her own x-rays on his phone and her name was visible on the screen. And he acknowledged that his phone syncs pictures to his iCloud. I mean, it was only for a broken wrist, but still didn't seem right. Don't really want people passing around medical information like it's a common picture. And that's actually true. That that physician, who we won't name names, is indeed is violating HIPAA if it's going up to his mm-hmm. iCloud account. We we frown on that here. You go to HIPAA jail here, and you get 
sent to mandatory school and um, all of our uh, images are locked down and they are not to be on your own personal device. And uh, so that is against the rules. And I'm, I'm sure that physician will likely be uh, encouraged to go to HIPAA school to learn what he can and cannot do or she can and cannot do. So thanks for the note, Justin. It's, it's good to reinforce the HIPAA requirements and not sharing people's personal information in uh, things like iCloud or Amazon Cloud or things along those lines. Totally right. Can't do that. It has to be on an encrypted computer. All patient information, personal yes. health information, PHI, has to be on an encrypted computer that's approved by the university. So we can't just use any Dropbox. You have to use the specific one that they approve. And I'm sure iCloud isn't part of it. Oh, no. You know, it's, any, it's, any computer here at the medical center with patient information or that has access to a computer with patient information has to be secured, password, locked down, encrypted. And if we send email that has patient information in it to someone else, it has to be encrypted. And you can do that by putting an encrypt code in the subject line. It will automatically encrypt it. Um, but, yeah, that's totally wrong can't do that. And that physician needs to go, as Michael said, to HIPAA school, which is we have to take HIPAA training every year here. We, we have, do indeed. We and we're, to, we're, um, we have to achieve a level known as competency where you take an exam and mm -hmm. you have to demonstrate that you understand the rules of the road, as they say, and you don't want to, to violate this. Yep. And there's a lot of information out there. All right, Hannah writes, Dear Twin Microbiologist, this paper just came across my news feed, and my goodness, just look at those figures. And the paper is Visualization of the Type 3 Secretion-Mediated Salmonella Host Cell Interface Using Cryo-Electron Tomography. And this is published in eLife, so it's open access. It is amazing, the pictures of this Type 3 secretion structure, which I think we've never seen before. In this kind of detail, you can exactly see this injection apparatus, the outer and inner membranes, and they have a, a model of it. They're beautiful. They're just beautiful. And you can see the needle tracks yeah. that the needle leaves behind in, if you will, the patient that is the bacterium or the eukaryotic cell that's being injected yeah. by the, yeah. the salmonella. Very cool. And they have some beautiful colorized images that really show you how elegant the system truly is. Nice figures uh, yeah, as well, putting all the structure together. The figure five is really cool. The injectosome interacting with the host cell membrane. So if you ever wondered exactly what this looked like, this is it. Open access. Check it out. Thank you, Hannah. Please show it to Dixon, too. It's such a visual paper. I'm sure he'd love it. I will. He's not here today. We'll show it to him tomorrow. All right, take that last one, Michael. All right, so uh, Joyce writes, Dear Twim Rockstars, great podcast. I love them and learn so much valuable information. I'm trying to listen to all the past episodes of all the podcasts, and I was just listening to Twim 79 and the discussion of the coral reefs and the effects of climate change. And I, too, find a lot of what is going on with regard to climate change to be depressing. But since I have joined Citizens Climate Lobby, I have so much more hope. I hope you will look at their website and see how fast they are growing and all they have accomplished in a short time and will mention this on your podcast. We as citizens can solve this problem. We just have to take action and this organization tells you how you can help accomplish the goal of slowing and then reversing climate change. Even if you don't have that much time, there is a lot you can do. And the website We'll go in the show notes for you. And there are a lot of great organizations out there working on this issue, but I believe this one has the most practical and focused approach. Their efforts have already built a bipartisan climate caucus in Congress that continues to grow. Their philosophy is that climate change is not and should not be a political issue. Both sides need to work together to solve this problem. Thanks for all that you do. Joyce Waterhouse. Thank you, Joyce. It should be uh, not be a political issue. Absolutely. In fact, science should not be a political issue, right? 
Fortunately. No, I'm, I mean, it, science has given us such great things like iPhones and That's right. hot running water and cold water and potable water. I mean, I just came from um, the ID infectious disease grand rounds where they were talking about the new hepatitis B vaccine. And Julie Westerink, who was giving grand rounds today, said that the two greatest things of the 20th century were vaccines and clean water. Mm. And I think she's right. Clean and available water has really done a lot to address the issues of public health. And uh, vaccines have indeed done a lot in the 20th century. It's truly one of our modern miracles of the of the last century. Dixon would add to that the toilet is another great invention. Oh, that's true, too, because you didn't have to carry <laughs> the stuff. Well, I mean, if you think about it, by effectively moving the chamber pot out of your bedroom, if you had a chamber pot, right, right. or going to the outhouse where the fecal material and urine would effectively hit groundwater, it, it really did a lot by um, creating a sanitary sewage system and sewage treatment plants, all of which are going to be infrastructure that we desperately have to replace as the United States is aging its infrastructure pretty quickly now. Yeah. And people used to take those chamber pots and throw them out in the street, right? That's right. Out the window. <sighs> That's why everyone got polio at an early age. That's right. <laughs> when they were still protected by their mother's antibodies. But then we had developed toilets and we delayed the infection and that started epidemics of polio. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Right. Well, it, it's it's absolutely fascinating that and the helicobacter loss in the developed world, mm. which started at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, along with the uh, introduction of indoor plumbing. Yeah. So that loss gave us ulcers, gave us ulcers and more importantly, asthma. Mm. That's right. Asthma. Because the virulent form of helicobacter is also been implicated that you need it when you're a toddler mm -hmm. to prevent the onset of uh, asthma. asthma right. And eventually through selection, you get rid of it by the time you're a teenager. Mm -hmm. And unless you don't get rid of it, then you will develop your ulcer in your 20s and 30s. And then unfortunately, if you don't delete it by then, then of course it will go into uh, a carcinoma of the stomach. Mm. But if you catch it early enough, you can treat it and get rid of well, it. Well, no, your body can – you you eliminate the uh, yeah. risk of asthma or you greatly reduce the risk of asthma and it, it gets selected out as your gut matures. Right. But if you have a person that doesn't lose the helicobacter oh. and, dis and develops ulcers, I remember growing up and everyone had their ulcers cut out by surgery. And, and we that, put them out of business. Yeah, be, that, right. We put them out of business because now you just take an antibiotic, right? An antibiotic and a proton pump inhibitor together. Amazing. Amazing. It, I'm telling it, you, my grandfather it, and my my grandmother both had surgery. Although so my, gran my, gran my, my, so grandfather, my grandfather my grandfather took Tagamet all his life. Oh, my. Remember, the, that, that's a proton oh, yes. pump inhibitor, right? But no yes. antibiotics because they didn't know about. They didn't know um, until the night. Mid 1980s, when yeah. the Australian pathologist fulfilled Koch's postulate. Yes, didn't he get a Nobel Prize for that? He got a Nobel Prize, and he would be sent to IRB jail today. He would. Yes, you can't do that anymore. So, anyway. I, I tell you, this is why science is so important. You, it is, you have, and why experiments are often good. For sure, and that's why we do Twim and all the other podcasts to try and share our excitement and knowledge about science with all of you out there. So tell everyone about it. And uh, if uh, you like what we do, consider supporting us at uh, microbe.tv slash contribute. There are a number of ways you can do that. You can find TWIM on any podcast player, and usually you can find it by searching. And, and subscribe, please, so that you get every episode. And if there's a way of favoriting a podcast on your podcast player, please do that. That helps us as well. And I'd also like to ask you if you could subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash P-R-O-F-V-R-R, because YouTube is giving grants for educational science 
videos and you need 25,000 subscribers to be able to apply. And micro TV has 16,000 as of this writing and I'm making an appeal. Just go over there, youtube.com slash P R O F E R R subscribe. It's free and it will help us to be able to apply for those grants. And of course, if you have questions and comments, you can send them to twim at microbe.tv. My colleague today has been Michael Schmidt, Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Vincent. And I just clicked the subscribe button to your YouTube channel. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it very much. If we hit 25,000, I think we're around 16,000 something. You're 16,140. That's good because yesterday when I started the appeal on Twitter, we were just over 15,000. So it's helped, although we do have uh, many thousands to go before I sleep. Before you <laughs> sleep. <laughs> Good grief. So, youtube.com slash P-R-O-F-E-R-R. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank ASM for their support of TWIM. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega of ASM. I also want to thank Ronald Jenkins for his music. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. 